You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Purchases in today's world can be fraught with moral choices. We're facing a climate crisis, after all, a future for our children of unprecedented extreme weather and global warming, a world at risk. So when we're choosing where to put our money, companies want to assure us that they are part of the solution, even if some of them might be part of the problem. And that's how you get ads that sound like this. Climate change is real and affects us all. We must do more than react. At RBC, we are rising to the challenge to work together and respond. That ad is part of a Royal Bank campaign that is facing an investigation from Canada's Competition Bureau. It's one of many such investigations over allegedly misleading advertising containing, quote, greenwashing. Now, nothing in the RBC case has been proven, and RBC denies that it's making misleading claims. They are also far from the only prominent corporation that is attempting to thread this kind of needle promoting their efforts to save the environment in an effort to drum up business that may or may not actually harm efforts to curb carbon emissions. So who makes these complaints to the Competition Bureau? And what kind of power do the Bureau's investigations have? What actually makes a campaign greenwashing as opposed to a legitimate attempt to sell products based on responsible messaging? And how can we, sitting at home watching TV or scrolling social media, hope to tell the difference? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Carl Meyer is the Narwhal's climate investigations reporter. He's based in Ottawa. Hello, Carl. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm really interested in figuring out how the Competition Bureau factors into greenwashing. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a fun piece to put together with my uh, colleague Fatima Syed. Maybe can you start by explaining because this is something I was you know unfamiliar with, except in a very broad and general sense. Like, what is the Competition Bureau's role in misleading advertising? Like in general, what does it do? Yeah, so the Competition Bureau is this federal agency, and they enforce the Competition Act, which is federal legislation, and a couple other laws too. And it's headed up by a commissioner, uh, Matthew Boswell. And part of his job is to investigate what they call deceptive marketing. So under the law, it's illegal to advertise or to market something or to make representations that's false or misleading. Mm -hmm. So the Bureau receives complaints. And actually, any six adults in Canada under the law can file a complaint with the commissioner and request that he launch an inquiry uh, into deceptive marketing. So the first step is a group of people putting together a complaint and filing it. And then the next step is the commissioner deciding to launch an inquiry, which doesn't always happen. Right. Give me an example of a more typical or more traditional complaints that would be filed so people have a sense of kind of what we're dealing with here. Yeah, I mean, the the classic example, and I guess the one where the term greenwashing started is hotels, telling people that they should like reuse their towels in order to help save the environment. So that, I mean, it sounds great, right? The problem is that if it doesn't actually lead to any energy reduction at the hotel, then it's greenwashing. It's telling people something and giving them the impression that it's going to happen when it's not actually leading to any environmental benefit or any significant environmental benefit. But it does allow the hotel to save money. Huh. So that's that's one example. But greenwashing, you know, can take many, many different forms. It can be like using, you know, vague terms like sustainable without the product being connected to anything really substantive, sustainable about the product. Or, or it could be like cherry picking facts. So you say one thing about your product is really great for the environment. And you leave out that it's actually terrible at another aspect. And another, uh, you know, way of greenwashing that that environmental groups have focused on is publicly promoting environmental initiatives that a company is doing while sort of privately lobbying against policies that would take a more stringent position on that. 
So that covers a whole lot of ground. And uh, what I want to get into here is if we've defined greenwashing for the terms of an inquiry like this, right? Because it's one thing for us to discuss the concept of it, and I think people are becoming more familiar with this concept, but it's another to like put it into a, a line of fact and prove it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting that the term greenwashing doesn't actually appear in the legislation. So you have to sort of rely on what the Competition Bureau has said publicly about the pattern, what the commissioner has said. And what you see, you know, Boswell has has framed this as kind of eco-fraud. That's the term that he used in a speech in um, 2022. He said his job was like protecting consumer confidence in the green economy. So what that means is, you know, all of us are trying to go about making these environmentally friendly choices when we go shopping and businesses know this. So they're trying to sell us stuff and they're trying to meet this demand for eco-friendly stuff by marketing their products that way. And, you know, Boswell said, we're seeing these environmental claims everywhere, but not all of them are legit. And he sees his job as sorting through what's legit. How does he do that? Maybe now explain uh, what actually happens. So a group gets together, makes a complaint. Uh, The commissioner decides to uh, accept the complaint and open an investigation. What does that entail? Yeah, well, you know, under the law, the inquiries are conducted in private. So actually, we don't know a lot of the fine grain details of the investigative process. I guess I should say, you know, to someone like me, who's primarily a climate policy reporter, it's it's a pretty opaque process. But what I can say is like, you know, we can see from some of the things that Boswell or the Competition Bureau has said what they're on the lookout for uh, when they do these types of investigations. So, you know, like I said, they're looking for false or misleading claims. They're looking for vague terms like eco-friendly that aren't connected to anything. We know they're looking for like packaging, like environmental themes on packaging, you know, like forests or trees or water that are just there to like sell the product and not related to anything. Right. And we know they're looking for labels that indicate some sort of like eco certification. And if those certification processes are not trustworthy. And what kind of power does the Bureau have? What kind of consequences come from these investigations if the claims are are founded? Yeah, so in theory, the penalties can be pretty big. I mean, we're t- if, if something goes to the courts and they can refer it to the competition tribunal, for example, and it can go to the courts, if something is pursued in as criminal, it can involve jail time. I think it's up to 14 years. Has that ever happened, though? And yeah, it is not, it, to my knowledge, it's not ever happened. And it's definitely not happening regularly. People are not going to jail left and right over greenwashing. If it's pursued in civil court, it's potentially like uh, fines. And the case that Boswell brings up and often people point to is the case of Curry of Canada. This is something that it's, it's a big case and it had a big penalty, but it's kind of the only big example. Well, explain it to us. So Curry Canada is the, the coffee pod makers. The Competition Bureau had investigated their claims about their single-use coffee pods being recyclable and found that that was false or misleading in certain areas. And they reached a settlement with the company and they agreed to pay $3 million. So on top of that, they donated $800,000 to charity. They paid $85,000 of like reimbursing the Bureau for their investigation costs. And in addition to, you know, changing their claims about recycling and publishing, you know, corrective notices all over their social media. So that's that's the big one everybody points to, but it's kind of the only big one out there. Well, walk us through, if you would, a few of the more notable ones, because the thing that sticks out to me is the ubiquity of this stuff and the fact that, like, these are some of the biggest companies in the country. Yeah. One of the most interesting examples to me is the case of Shell. So Shell Canada, the oil and gas company, they also run Shell gas stations. So in 2020, Shell launched this program called Drive Carbon Neutral. So the idea was like if you went to a Shell gas station and you bought their gas and you use their app to buy the gas, you could opt into this program that would offset the pollution that was created by your gas with the carbon credits that Shell would go buy from these forest conservation projects. So Shell was like marketing this idea is like you can drive carbon neutral. In other words, like don't worry about your 
the missions that your car is making because we're offsetting those somewhere else in the world. Right. And so Greenpeace filed a complaint against them saying like, you know, first of all, relying on forests to offset vehicle emissions is unreliable because forests take like decades to take carbon out of the air and cars put it up there instantaneously. And then forests are, forests themselves are unreliable. You know, we saw last summer that huge amounts of forests are succumbing to wildfires. There are other sort of insect threats too. So they're not always going to be there for us. And then more specifically, Greenpeace in their complaint outlined like problems which each, with each of the programs that Shell was relying on. So they said one of the programs had like overstated how much forest was available. One of the programs, like the, the forest was actually being logged instead of being conserved. One of the programs was like piggybacking off another conservation program that was already in place. So the Competition Bureau began investigating this in private, actually looked at it for a couple of years. But what happened was Shell started getting like scrutiny around the world. So there was an, a similar advertising bureau in the Netherlands that told Shell to pull a similar program there. Eventually Shell, like the global company Shell, just stopped doing offsets. And then Shell decided to end the program in Canada just a couple months ago. And then the Competition Bureau told Greenpeace they were closing their investigation because Shell had removed programs, so there was nothing left to investigate. I totally get why a lot of these claims and complaints might come towards oil and gas companies. That's always one that I think a lot of people see advertisements from and are like, huh, okay, sure. But it's not all oil and gas, right? Can you give us another example or two of, of non-oil and gas companies that uh, do this kind of stuff? Kerrig is a great one. Anything else? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the most recent one is, is Lululemon, huh. the clothing company. So Stand Earth is the name of the environmental group that filed a complaint about the company saying that they had this whole program called Bee Planet. I don't know if you're familiar with the little lemon, but they had this sort of program. It was Bee Human, Bee Well, Bee Planet. And the Bee Planet part was that they said their products were like helping restore the environment and they were avoiding environmental harm. And... Stan said the company had seen this like explosive growth in the last few years, and that growth has been driven by fossil fuels. So they, there's allegations that their company, that their factories are powered by coal in Asia. And, you know, the fashion industry in general has been moving more and more towards shipping their clothes over aviation, which is obviously a really polluting way of transporting goods, you know, fast fashion. And then they said, the company's own sustainability reports showed its emissions had grown ever since they introduced this B Planet stuff. So that's a brand new one. And, and we don't even know yet if the Bureau is open to investigation. So that's just a complaint with nothing proven at all. Right. It's interesting because it feels to me, and I'm sure to people listening, like every second or third advertisement is making uh, these kind of claims. And the terms, to your point and the Bureau's point, are, are often so vague, you know, sustainability or even just like forests, that I just wonder how you can determine what is an actual, like, actionable complaint here and what is just another attempt to, like, you know, capitalize on our climate anxiety to fuel our spending. Well, I guess I'd say two things. First of all, like, this greenwashing is pretty pervasive in our lives because of this moment that we're in dealing with the climate crisis and our emissions and understanding that we only have a matter of years before we get to 2030 and then a couple decades before 2050 is really a short frame of time frame. And, and we also see the consequences of climate change happening in real time in our lives and not just in Canada, but around the world. So people want to do the right thing. I think that there's a strong impetus for people to, and, and, and companies know that. And so, but I also think it's like, it's really easy to slip into it. Even if you understand greenwashing on, on sort of a rational level, like we're all busy people, right? Like mm -hmm. we have families and jobs and swim class and math homework and all that other stuff. And we need to take care of every day and you just run to the grocery store and you get something or whatever you're doing. So I think, you know, it's important to have a process in here that is holding companies to account for their claims and ensuring that they can't continue to market things that are false. 
even if we might know that on some sort of level, because not all of us can be, you know, aware of everything all the time. In general, do we have a sense of how many of these complaints actually result in action? Well, we don't know the full list of complaints that are filed. The Bureau has sort of cited confidentiality provisions in the law to say that they can't confirm stuff like that. So you know these ones because you've been made aware by the groups who filed them? Yeah, exactly. Yes. We only know from the groups that come out and say publicly that they file a complaint or that they've they've gotten this letter from the Bureau that says that they've launched an investigation. But in theory... The examples in your story are all environmental groups. Is it all environmental groups filing these complaints? You mentioned it only takes six people. Like, we could all file one uh, here at The Big Story if we wanted to, right? Yeah. Well, so for, first of all, the, in this, that was what the story was, was focusing on, is greenwashing complaints. And yes, those t- have tended to come from environmental groups, uh, especially lately. And that is something that the Bureau told us was that they're seeing an upsurge in these types of complaints being filed with them. And so that's what we looked at. But I would say, you know, one thing to remember is these are not like one page summary complaints. This is not somebody just firing something off to the competition bureau because they're because they're pissed off about something. It's a they're detailed documents. They're laid out in like a legal sort of fashion. The legislation actually says what you need to include in the complaint. And it's not just your allegations. It's also the grounds for it, the evidence supporting it. Do you get the sense that we are wise a little bit to greenwashing by now and there might come a tipping point where the value of making these claims, whether they're true or not from companies, will be outweighed by the fact that people just don't buy them anymore? I mean, I've seen so many of these that I have to say that I am now skeptical of any product that tells me like it's 100% sustainable or will improve my carbon footprint or et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. To be honest with you, I think that it's actually going to become more and more pervasive. Like I was saying, I think that it's just going to become so pervasive in our lives. This issue of climate change is touching everything already. It's going to become even more so like that. And people are just going to become more, they're going to, they're going to have more scrutiny over the products that they're buying. And so in order to compete in that world, companies are going to have to make their products appear more and more environmentally friendly. So yeah. Last question then. Do you have an example of either a complaint that was uh, found to be unfounded, that the claims were actually true, or even just an example of a really good sustainable product campaign that tells the truth and actually delivers on what it promises? Yeah, I I don't. You don't? (laughs) That's actually a great that's actually a great question. I think that's actually a, a great idea for like a follow up piece if we looked at companies that have succeeded in this space. Because there's got to be some, right? All these companies are making these claims. They now know, or they should know, that there are misleading advertising laws. Some of them, I'm sure, like I don't mean to slander all businesses here, because some of them, I'm sure, are coming from a good place and actually uh, making promises that at least they believe they're delivering on. Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the points that Matthew Boswell, the commissioner, has made, is that companies that are selling products that are genuinely good for the environment need a sort of fighting chance of, of getting your business. And that's part of the issue of having greenwashing claims out there in the marketplaces is sort of distorting that, that you're unable to get to that company or that product because you have already been misled by other companies. But I think it's also, you know, it's important to remember, like, these are claims that the businesses are making on their own. They could just not make these claims. Right. <laughs> right? Like, it's this isn't about not being able to sell your product. This is about giving people the right information so they can make more informed decisions. And if you don't have a legitimate environmental claim to make, you don't have to make it. (laughs) Carl, thank you so much for this. Uh, It's a fascinating discussion. And I look forward to our conversation about companies that deliver on their climate promises. Yeah, me too. Carl Meyer, the Narwhal's climate investigations reporter. That was the big story for more from us including previous collaborations with the Narwhal, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can, as always, send us your feedback on our coverage of environmental issues or our coverage of anything else or something we haven't covered but should. The way to do any of those things is via email at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or with the phone, you can call us 416-935-5935. 
Leave us a voicemail. Make your point. Make your suggestion. Be heard. The Big Story is available to be heard in any podcast player that you like. And it's on your smart speaker if you ask it to play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.